Marco. Sean. We're on the road again. Yeah, you are. You're going. I heard the news. You're going to Toronto. So. Oh, Toronto. I'm going to get get to the East Coast first and then make my way up to Toronto. You're not driving from uh, L.A.? I, I'm not going to drive from L.A. I might <laughs> I might drive from Manhattan. We'll see. I don't know. It could That's be a, a fun uh, fall color drive. We'll see. <laughs> a lot more yeah. feasible. And yes. it could be beautiful, actually. Uh, I'm sure uh, it's beautiful. The, coast, like that. the camera will be on, uh, at the ready. I'll but, take you uh, forever to get there. I, looked, I think it's about eight hours. No, but you'll stop every oh, second. Oh, true. Yeah, it's eight good. hours driving, eight <laughs> hours photography, probably. Yeah. <laughs> all worth it. All worth it. It is all worth it. And the best part... All colors are cool, but the best part is to meet amazing people in Toronto. And uh, today we get to meet uh, virtually an amazing person, Ashley Jess, who has a speaking uh, spot there in Toronto at Sector, uh, led by Black Hat. Ashley, thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. This is going to be fun. It's a topic that uh, caught my attention as I was going through the agenda of uh, Sector, which, by the way, is in Toronto, if you haven't figured that out, October 21st to the 24th. And uh, yeah, we'll be covering the event. We have a few chats we're lining up and Ashley's uh, our first one. So uh, we're excited to have you on. And just to get the session out there as well, it's, it's called Hello from the Dumpster Fire. We, we love that dumpster fire, don't we? I uh, think real that's examples. why you picked the I know. conversation. So the title makes makes a big difference. The title makes a big difference, yeah. <laughs> Uh, real examples of artificially generated malware disinformation and scam campaigns. Uh, lots of fun stuff to talk about. Um, to start, though, maybe a few words about what you're up to, the research you do, how this all, I'm, I'm sure it's formed by all the fun stuff you get to see day in and day out. <laughs> the, yes. The you get to interact with the dark web, you get to cruise and all that fun stuff. So. Yeah. So my organization, you know, we monitor the dark web, we do cyber threat intelligence and, you know, me being a senior threat, you know, Intel analyst with Intel 471, we, um, you know, it's a wide range of things that you can research. So I've got this unique little pocket that kind of landed in, in my particular desk that is Gen AI, but also disinformation, propaganda, elections. I had the Olympics while those were going on, which also, you know, these particular areas have a lot of overlap. Um, so I've done a lot of research into where those specific um, kind of topics intersect with each other. So namely for this presentation, how AI is being used in these campaigns. And then of course, there's also the financially motivated, you know, threat actor side of it all with scam campaigns and malware lures. And are they using it for malware development? And what are we seeing on the front lines? And, you know, spoiler alert, it's a it's a hot mess, hence the, uh, the title of the presentation. <laughs> I have to ask this question. I know Mark, you want to jump in, but you, no. you mentioned the Olympics, and the the one thing, and, and Mark and I play around with uh, him more more so than me, I think, with uh, multilingual uh, Gen AI, and I think the, just the language thing. And it, so I'm, I'm thinking about Paris, and obviously native language French. Um, scams would be in French, and so I'm wondering how how things change. And I don't know if you have any nuggets from interesting things that you saw during the Olympics that that were specifically AI oriented that caused concern or perhaps even some havoc? Yeah, so we saw, um, like, especially in the disinformation space, we saw some generative AI images, we saw some that had to do with like politically motivated graffiti on walls that didn't exist that had to do with like, the Israel-Palestine conflict, trying to perpetuate a narrative there. Uh, there was also an entirely um, generated film called The Olympics Has Fallen after the film Olympus Has Fallen. You know, they're getting punny, I guess. Um, that was, you know, Russian propaganda. And that one had an entire narrator with a uh, deep fake Tom Cruise as the main narrator there. Um, it had, you know, an entire, you know, the, the Netflix logo. It was actually pretty well produced, um, but used Gen AI to kind of have that sort of product. And that that really showcases, even now is like Gen AI gets better. Um, and, you know, there's all these tools out there. There's one I'll talk about in the talk that can, you know, deep fake you with a single image now, you know, that threshold used to be that you needed at least 500 images to have even something 
remotely believable. And even then, you know, the mouth still looked funky. So as this technology improves, the ones that get even stronger are still those people that have really high um, amounts of source material online, which is high profile individuals like celebrities who there's a lot of samples of Tom Cruise's voice, face, all angles, photos. Um, so it shows as it gets better to deep fake, you know, your average Joe Schmo, it gets 10, 15, 20 times better to deep fake a celebrity. So I'm waiting for Marco to get deep faked. He's out there all over the place. <laughs> uh, I'm deep fake right now. <laughs> yeah, I, don't, I don't know. I, I have a joke. I said a few times that it, the deep fake, uh, I, it wasn't a deep fake, but I had my, my voice clone in one of the first. Uh, uh, opportunity I had just because I wanted to try. You know, it's easy. I get the podcast, just dump a few there. I mean, I of course I'm I'm not a target, or we all are a target, but um, definitely if they want to get my voice and Sean's voice, it's pretty easy. Um, and I it's like funny to say I'm not a deep fake. I'm a real shallow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but the funny story is that it was too perfect because I have this Italian accent and the. And the fake actually had a perfect English. And my wife said, yeah, it sounds like you, but it's not you. <laughs> uh, so, you know, kind of a joke of, uh, and I'm going somewhere with this. Uh, does it become too perfect that we can actually spot things? Or, I mean, are we past that threshold that, you know, maybe we can spot the imperfection before and now it's too perfect and unreal at the same time? I do think it depends. I feel like this fear of deep fakes is pretty split in its capabilities right now with video deep fake versus audio deep fake. Um, audio is definitely the easier, cheaper, quicker one to do with fewer source material still. Um, that will change over time. It might even change by the time sector actually comes around. Who knows? It's it's so quickly mm -hmm. evolving. <laughs> it's every day is a new story. But um, it is possible. I and mean, least on the threat actor side, though, um, that perfection is actually what makes it pretty powerful because not necessarily when they're impersonating someone you know well, but when they're doing a cold call pretending to be from, you know, a particular company and, you know, some of those red flags you might have looked for before that you get trained on is, you know, accents or hearing, you know, a lot of chatter from, you know, they're in this big call center. All of that's gone. So um, it is possible uh, they are now starting to add in those vocal imperfections as well. You know, those mm. ums and hmms and, you know, a quick little like, ha <laughs> like as they're talking um, to try to re-put in that human inflection and not have those, like when you don't have those pauses, it does sound a little too perfect. So now they're adding mm -hmm. it back in to be even more human because there are, the whole problem when we dive into this in the presentation is, you know, there are legitimate uses for all this technology too. It's a two-sided coin. It's the same with any sort of technological development. There are legitimate reasons why we're moving this way, but as it gets better, the other side of the coin is that there are illicit uses of it as well, right? So, um, you know, as they make it more realistic, that's great for its legitimate purposes, but illicitly, it means it's still getting yeah. easier and easier. And I'm gonna, I wanna say something about this because I finished not too long ago to read The, the Singularity is Nearer by Ray Kurzweil. And one of the thing is like the moment that you get there, AI is going to have to dumb down itself if we want to pass the Turing test, because otherwise it will be too good and it will be detected as an artificial intelligence. <laughs> so it's kind of like we, we, we're kind of there, I guess, because you see some video now and on social media where they they show and say, well, this I can't believe this person is it's created by an artificial intelligence as a video and it is flawless and i am there it's probably too flawless the it's more like too re too perfect but again i'll go the other way around yeah and it's it's this interesting space right now because it is constantly improving but then you'll go and you'll beta test these things and there are obvious flaws and there's the issues with hallucinations with AI right now, which is mm -hmm. where it will just confidently tell you something incorrect. And um, there was a computer scientist who just gave a TED talk um, a couple of weeks ago that was excellent, in which she discussed testing some models. And the best one she had, I think, still had a 17% failure rating. But it's so confident in telling you that it's incorrect, and it will make up sources and make up data that mm -hmm. unless you're going and manually checking, you're going to miss it because those answers do look realistic. It is modeling the expected answer 
Um, so it takes a certain level of critical thinking to, um, you know, make sure that it is actually factually correct. So it is this weird dichotomy that it is getting used and, and it's more impressive than it's ever been, but it's still not this infallible technology. But then the third kind of aspect is at the end of the day, cyber criminals are still using it no matter what. Um, so, you know, this presentation is hopefully diving into just a very realistic objective view on the front lines of all how those three aspects play into each other and what it's looking like out there. Hence, you know, the dumpster fire, because it's more complicated <laughs> than it might seem. So, yeah, and I, I think for me, what makes it complicated is who who owns or who's responsible for protecting us, individuals, businesses, communities, societies, nations, whatever level. And I think if if we're putting the onus on the individual to understand and spot and know how to react properly or whatever, I, I think that's a very hard problem to scale a solution around. And so then, well, is it an organization? Which organization do they use technology? I didn't, and Dennis Cruz, I don't know if you know him, he, he uh, presented at OWASP AppSec in, in Lisbon about this idea that you could use a prompt to generate responses and use uh, different models of LLMs to validate multiple ways these responses. And so basically using technology and, and, the, and the AI to validate itself. <laughs> so you, you get a better result. Um, but I don't know how we get that into the hands of whomever needs it. So maybe your thoughts on that in terms of responsibility, maybe connect that to your presentation. Who are you speaking to? And what are some of the things you hope to share with them? Yeah, so it, there's a lot of different aspects of responsibility. There's responsibility of, you know, the output and making sure that it's accurate. There's responsibility of, you know, some people are more advocating on the side of government regulation and, you know, regulating this content getting shared online. Or is it you know, whoever shares the content, is it more their responsibility to have a system for content provenance in place and using things like Web3 to really track the original source of that data? Do we have the infrastructure to do that? Now there's vendor spaces out there who are trying to be the ones claiming responsibility to be able to detect deep fakes and be able to detect, you know, artificially generated content. And I've tested a few of them. I've literally put in a paragraph straight into OpenAI's chat GPT, copied it straight into one of those vendor tools and it told me I was 100% human. If you're using that tool and it's telling you that, who does the responsibility lie with then as well? So um, there's a couple different things. And I really do think government regulation of this space is this first spot that's pretty severely lacking, especially when it comes to certain uses that criminals are using this tool for, namely like CSAM is a great um, example there, artificially generated CSAM regulation is lacking there. So, um, you know, this is a presentation in Canada, so I am trying to keep it, um, I'm discussing more of the vendor space and, and you know, content provenance space of it all with a brief, you know, sort of touch on um, regulation, but there's so many people internationally, I can't possibly touch on all of their possible government regulations and I want to keep it as appealing to a wide audience as possible. So um, yeah, I'll be discussing um, a little bit more on, um, you know, content provenance detection and prevention at like an individual level um, and then, you know, where regulation should go. So. And how about the fact that beside the quality, I see the quantity be an issue and how easy it is to for everybody to jump in and now you just need a, a picture to to create something you know so it's it, it, as you said it's going to get better and better but also more and more accessible so while we can create firewall for internal big companies the everyday people that you know used to be the one like grandma that knock on the door somebody dressed like a cop oh it must be a cop um <laughs> and social engineering like that I feel like those are going to be even more and more targeted because they don't have the guards up. What's your thought on that? Yeah, and it is it is a lower a lower barrier overall. It's a lower barrier to even use this type of technology. It's a lower barrier to use it for more technical capabilities. It's cheaper than ever before. You need less source material than ever before. Um, yeah, there's a wider use of it. And then there's also that it's more widespread in internal systems to begin with. And now there's actors exploiting, you know, developers who have legitimately used AI to code, you know, bits of their back end 
they're now finding vulnerabilities in AI generated code to then target and then also specific targeting of AI systems. So yeah, it's generally just overall a lower barrier. As I mentioned, you know, even with social engineering, you know, you need such little material, you know, there where's the scam where people call their grandmother and pretend like they were kidnapped. Like it's very easy now to mm-hmm. deep fake your grandkids voice to make it even more believable. It's very easy to, um, you know, make a single image, even over a video to make a false profile that's then used for, I don't know, like pig butchering, you know, on some social media accounts. Mm So same with that for folks. Oh, for pig butchering. Yeah. Pig butchering is a um, crypto investment scheme. Usually they'll reach out to you on uh, social media or WhatsApp or via text message. And they might even say, they might even not use your real name. They might not say, Hey, Sean, they might just say like, Hey, John, I've got what you need. And then you reply and say like, this isn't John, this is Sean. And then um, they start speaking with you. Sometimes it's romantic in nature. Sometimes it's not, but typically they they do pose as like a woman if they're speaking to a male. Um, and then they'll eventually pivot to um, cryptocurrency discussions and get you to invest in cryptocurrency. Um, they might even start you on a legitimate website and then we'll pivot you to an illegitimate website where they're showing you a very large unrealistic return on your investment. Uh, the term comes from the ja- or from the sorry the Chinese term Xia Jupan. Um, it means like pig killing, but it's because they are fattening up their victim before they slaughter them by taking their money. It's really a terrible How system romantic. that has, yeah, has a lot of links into <laughs> human trafficking and um, exploit exploited labor on the other end. You know, these scammers are often held in really atrocious mm-hmm. camps in places like Malaysia and Cambodia. So wow. um, very complicated scheme, but it's easy for them to make appealing false profiles where they're not even necessarily using an image of somebody who exists anymore. So, hmm. yeah, so really interesting. Sean, I want to I want to go back on the talk because reading on mm. the the website and the presentation of your of your talk, the the, the end the, the final sentence is that for you the the content provenance um, and the method for detecting artificially generating content is kind of keys. No, I don't want to. And and I'm I'm looking at this thinking, I are we trying to tell the people that are using the content to do their homework or is something that you are thinking the big social media, the Gmail, the Apple, the, the, the people that are at the top of the provider of everyday's people, email and social media to be the one that it, to create filters for. Yeah, the latter in this case yeah. is really the ideal sort of situation. It gives users a way to confirm, you know, that the provenance of that published content is really there using information that can't be removed from that content. So um, Adobe has done some research in this area. They've done the Content Authenticity Initiative. And then there's also the Coalition for Content Provenance and Authenticity, or C2PA. Um, They have a standard that marks content with provenance information and uses cryptogenic algorithms to insert hashes at like set intervals during a video that would change if that video was altered. And then, you know, obviously that needs to be integrated in a way where it's streamlined in the user experience where they don't have to go out of their way. So, you know, check it, but it should just be a a very easy way to verify that, you know, the video that was sent to you was sent by this person and wasn't altered anywhere in between. Or if someone downloads it and reposts it on some X account with a very similar name, that's not verified or is the paid blue, you know, check system now that you'll be able to tell the difference on the user end, but there's a long way to go um, in that, you know, there's a lot of different research going on. MIT's got some research in the space. There's a lot of space in like, um, you know, web three and using the blockchain to do that sort of thing. So um, lots of interesting research happening in the content provenance space, but it is something that is going to become or need to become front of mind for a lot of people consuming media. Um, And it needs to be easy because the cognitive load of trying to verify every single image that you would see as you're scrolling Twitter or Instagram or Facebook, it's impossible. Like it's, it's impossible. It's going to happen. Yeah. (laughs) Um, So it needs to be user facing. So it needs to be integrated into the back end by these providers. And that makes me uh, think about, Mark, we've had conversations, uh, the, the bad bot report where, is it more than half of the internet traffic is non-human, right? So mm-hmm. some machine-driven bot-enabled traffic. 
So we've crossed the point where machines have taken over the network. And now I, I can see a world, if, if we're not there already, I don't know if anybody's tracking this, where content is machine driven. Machine yep, there's a lot of um, research into the concept of um, pink slime journalism, which is, you know, these news agencies that are posing as, you know, your local newspaper that actually are funded typically by political entities. But I mean, there's foreign pink slime. There's a couple different versions of pink slime um, that are usually using Gen AI to generate filler content to kind of establish newspapers having a bunch of articles. And then, in fact, are pushing articles that usually have some sort of um, ulterior motive, whether that's, you know, on the political side, getting you to vote one way or the other, on the foreign side, foreign interference one way or the other, um, but they're using Gen AI to supplement the rest of their website. And it's been estimated now, um, there's a couple of great organizations that track um, some of these websites that they have now tracked a number of pink slime websites that outnumber the number of local newspapers still available in the United States, to use US as an example, meaning that the false websites now outnumber the legitimate ones. Uh, a, a fascinating topic. Dumps are <laughs> fired. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I, I, I hope you. I hope you get to investigate and explore and experience other things besides this to kind of lift you up and out of the dumpster. <laughs> There's a lot of other great talks in the AI track that have yeah. you know proposed solutions. So I'm excited to go sit in on all of those for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it's been a, an absolute treat chatting with you, uh, Ashley, and. Of course, I, I encourage everybody, hopefully I'll see you there in uh, Toronto, October 21st through the 24th at Sector. It's a, a Black Hat Informa event. And Ashley Session, hello from the Dumpster Fire, real examples of artificially generated malware, disinformation, and scam campaigns is on, oh, is there no, no date and time? We don't know. I don't think they've gotten this schedule yet, but I'll be on one of those days. So. You're, you're there one of those three days. Everybody should go for the three days and, and be sure to connect with Ashley. And you mentioned a few resources, so maybe uh, maybe be kind enough to share those so we can um, share some of those things with folks listening and watching yeah, of course. this episode. And uh, yeah, good stuff. I appreciate you taking the time to share. Congratulations on uh, getting a spot to speak there. I know it's a, a fun a fun deal submitting uh, presentations. and My uh, first good one. So. Look at that. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's amazing. Yep. Exciting. Nice one. Well, I hope everybody gets to uh, to meet you and en enjoy your session. Have a good chat with you afterwards. And everybody listening, watching, please do stay tuned for more coverage on the road and on location. Subscribe. Uh, to subscribe. Uh, is it up or down or sideways? I don't know. It's mm -hmm. right here. I'm, I'm in a click very the click the nose. right now. Somewhere, <laughs> somewhere at the end, you're going to see it. Somewhere at the end. watching the video. Very good. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Ashley. Yeah, thank you.